Welcome to Shoreline Conversations. I'm Thomas, the producer of this podcast. And this week, we're taking a little bit of a look back. We did a series many years ago called Intellectual Barriers to Faith. And in that series, we did a a number of episodes. Uh, It was kind of our first attempt at a podcast. And um, we talked about a number of subjects. And Zach Harney, Kevin's son, who was a pastor on staff at the time, since he has uh, uh, moved on, he lives in Michigan with his wife now. Um, But we had a conversation with Zach about the historicity of Jesus And uh, it's a two-parter, and we're actually preparing uh, for the Shoreline Conversations podcast. We're preparing our next series. It's going to be a a bigger series. I'm really excited about it. It's kind of based on the core tenets, the pillars of the Christian faith. We're going to be talking about why we believe there's a God at all, uh, why we believe that Christianity is um, the best explanation for kind of who that God is. We're going to go over uh, a, a lot of different uh, pillars of faith. And what better way to kind of prepare us for that series than talking about Jesus uh, and the historicity of Jesus. So these are oldies but goodies, and it gives us a couple more weeks to prepare for uh, the series coming up and line up all the uh, the guests we're going to have on there. We're super excited about it. But anyway, uh, here is the conversation I had many years ago with uh, uh, Zach Harney about the historicity of Jesus. I hope you enjoy. This week we're talking about the historical Jesus. And uh, before we dive into that, um, you, uh, you've been interested in history for a while. Why, why is history important to you, taking a real legitimate look at, uh, at history? Hmm. Yeah, uh, well, for a number of reasons. I mean, obviously, everything that we have today and that we see today is based off of a progression of historical events and historical figures that led us to where we are today. Uh, so to me, that's just interesting to find out sort of what your heritage is. I've always been interested in family history, lineage, those kind of things. So um, just knowing where you came from, I think, is, uh, if not important, at least interesting. Mm -hmm. And then uh, more importantly and useful, I think, is that um, we learn from the past. I mean, you can practically be, you know, a fortune teller or someone who sees into the future simply by studying history. I mean, human behavior doesn't change that dramatically. I mean, the, depending on the way that culture shifts, you know, uh, people change, cultures change, what's important to them. Um, but a lot of human behavior, uh, you can see just patterns throughout history of things happening over and over again. And I think one of the main things that got me interested in history in the first place was that I had a, uh, a teacher in high school um, if he ever heard this podcast, which I doubt he would, uh, I'll give a shout out to Mr. Cotts, but <laughs> he, uh, he kind of inspired me to go down this track quite a bit because, um, he was able to, in our classroom in my AP government, AP US history, he was really able to predict things that were going to happen in the future, you know? So this was 2003 beginning of, uh, you know, the Iraq war. And now looking back, I mean, he was predicting things that were six, seven, eight years in the future of where we were going to be, you know, what we we're going to be doing in relation to other countries in that area. And it was all because of his knowledge of history and how, um, how it typically plays out when you have different powers, the powers that be going at each other and the way they interact with each other. So uh, I just think it's a pretty, um, interesting way to be able to look at the world through the lens of history um, but also very frustrating because you see problems coming and you know they're going to happen and a lot of times you know there's really nothing you can do to stop them Mm -hmm. so uh, it's uh, sort of a curse and uh, I don't know a blessing to to study history because you, you really do get a sense of the scope of human behavior and uh, the consistency throughout time, but also it's such a grand scale that uh, oftentimes you feel like you can't really do anything to, you know, sort of uh, make it go any different than it's going to anyway. Yeah. Well, we're talking about the historical Jesus. So um, 
through that lens, through somebody who takes history very seriously, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, who Jesus was? Uh, what, what does history have to say about who, who Jesus was? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll start out with at least um, just kind of giving a general idea of what we believe here at Shoreline. Um, we believe that Jesus was the Son of God and he was God incarnated in human flesh and walked the world, experienced what humans experience, um, but was God. And because of the fact that he was both human and divine, he was able to pay a perfect sacrifice for our sins to bring us back into communion with God through his death and resurrection and to renew that relationship, the perfect sacrifice to pay for our sins. So that's uh, you know a pretty basic traditional understanding of who Jesus was from a uh, pretty standard Christian um, perspective. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, that's not the way that everybody sees Jesus. And as I've been studying a lot on this topic, the one thing you'll kind of see over and over again, I think, is that a lot of times, you know, you, you'll hear different groups talk about him or, or different scholars, and they may say, you know, he was this intellectual genius. He was a liberator of the oppressed. He was a religious fanatic. Um, I've even heard, you know, feminist, uh, the earliest feminist, you know, all of these different uh, perspectives. Mm -hmm. But what you tend to notice with a lot of these perspectives is that uh, each group or, you know, generation or scholar, I think, tends to see a little bit of themselves or, or at least maybe what, what their desires are <clears throat> for Jesus. And I heard, uh, I heard someone pose the question, you know, could the Jesus we, uh, we see simply be the one that we want to see? Uh, and so looking at it almost as if, um, you know, when we're searching for this Jesus, well, what are we searching for at the beginning? What do we want to find? Because probably what we want to find may be what we find because that's kind of the way we're approaching it. Um, but there are a lot of different uh, depictions, and I kind of want to walk through a few of those. Um, many of the world religions have different depictions of Jesus. So you look at Islam. Um, in Islam, uh, Jesus is called uh, Isa or Isa, depending on uh, who you ask. And now, when I, uh, I also need to sort of preface this by saying when I say in Islam or in Judaism or in, that's a, that's a huge scoping statement. So um, it's... You can't really say, I mean, there's so many sects within Islam. There's so many sects within Judaism, within Christianity. So when I say that, what I mean is that generally, if you ask someone from that faith, this is... Orthodox Islam, Orthodox Judaism, kind of yeah. what's traditionally regarded as those. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, someone might be saying from a particular sect of that faith, well, that's not exactly what I believe. And that's fair. We don't have enough time to go mm -hmm. into every single sect of every single religion. But I'm going to kind of give these... Be, the big scope of it. So uh, in Islam, like I said, Jesus, uh, Isa or Isa, is one of uh, God's highest ranked and most beloved prophets. So uh, they don't believe that Jesus is an incarnation of God. They don't believe he's the son of God. Uh, they do believe he was a prophet. Uh, they also don't believe that he was crucified. Essentially, um, what many of them would say is that uh, God sort of protected him from that, made someone in his likeness to sort of trick them, and they crucified someone who wasn't Jesus, um, and so he was never actually crucified. Um, and, and really the reason why they, they talk about it like this is because uh, the text emphasized uh, monotheism. That's the very, it's a very important tenet mm -hmm. of Islam is strict monotheism. Uh, so to any sort of uh, allusion to any trinity or you know someone else sharing power with God is just uh, really off the table, and that would be considered idolatry. Um, so uh, at the end of the day, the truth is they don't believe that he's the Messiah, but they do believe he's very important. Um, in the Baha'i faith, which is more recent, um, they actually consider Jesus to be a manifestation of God. So uh, also in that list of manifestations, would they would include uh, Moses, they would include Buddha, they would include uh, Muhammad. And uh, essentially what they would say is that, you know, God 
occasionally expresses himself through this manifestation on earth and you get to see you know some of god's character through that it's really um it's no surprise that that's a newer uh, mm-hmm. faith expression and g- give us like a, a one two sentence version of, of baha'i because i think most people probably won't have, have heard of this faith Yeah, so it it originates out of the Middle East in the 19th century, and really what the focus is is almost taking all of the world religions and, like I guess, syncretically combining them and making Mm -hmm. them make sense together. So when you say, you know, Jesus is a manifestation of God and Muhammad is a manifestation of God and Moses and Buddha... Essentially, what you're saying is that all world religions are connected, and the only reason I think that you know Baha'i would be considered a formal religion is because uh, it's really taking all of those things and saying we need to believe the truth in all of those. It's you know it's all it's almost a more formal way of some of the new age movements where they say hey okay. let's coexist. They're all you know they're all true in their own way. But it's more it's a more formal way of looking at that than some of the ways we would see it around us in America. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So do some more research if you <laughs> want to know more about that faith, because I'm definitely not an expert in that. Um, uh-huh. Yeah. And then uh, the Jewish faith, obviously extremely important to uh, the life of Jesus. Jesus himself was Jewish. And so, uh, you know, what do the Jewish people believe about Jesus? There's a close association, but what do they actually believe? Um, You know, again, I say it's tough to say exactly what they believe as a people group, um, but what what they definitely don't believe is that he's the Messiah. So whether they believe he was a good prophet or more likely a false prophet, um, it would depend on who you ask and where they are in that continuum Mm -hmm. of their perspective on Jesus, but certainly he was not the Messiah that they were waiting for. Um, there's a particular amount of prophecies that they believe would be fulfilled through Jesus, and uh, any Jewish person who does not believe Jesus is the Messiah, it's because he didn't meet those prophecies. Yeah. Um, and it was interesting, I was watching this interview, I believe it was with Peter, uh, sociologist Peter Berger, and he was talking about interviewing this rabbi and and asking him the question what do you think about jesus and he said i don't Hmm. and i thought that was interesting because you know as christians sometimes we think well there's this extremely close association between judaism and christianity and you know christ and judaism he was jewish Mm -hmm. um but but for many modern day jewish people that are practicing it's really sort of a, a side issue other than the fact that they're surrounded by, you know, influences from Christianity. Mm-hmm. But as far as what they think of him as a person that's important to their faith, yeah. it's not, <laughs> is what he's saying. I don't think about Jesus. Uh, so, you know, I could go through, you know, some of the prophecies that they believe that Jesus didn't fulfill. You know, Jewish people would have expected uh Jesus to have built, you know, a third physical temple. Mm -hmm. Um, They would have expected Jesus to gather all the Jews back to the land of Israel. Uh, That's a passage in Isaiah 43. They would have expected him to usher in a world peace as far as, you know, not in the sense that we might consider, you know, peace that is available through him, but actual peace between nations. Mm. And so uh, for them, it's no surprise that they don't see Jesus as fulfilling those in in the sense that they expected them to be fulfilled in yeah. that time period. Um, now, there's an exception to that, uh, a sect within Judaism, although some people would probably be even offended to hear that th- they're you know, a sect of Judaism, but um, would be Messianic Judaism. And essentially, it's a more recent form of Judaism where uh, people that have you know, practice Jewish customs, they come from a Jewish background, have said, you know, we accept Christ as the Messiah. And so essentially what it looks like from what I've seen uh, from friends that were Messianic Jews is that really they pretty much wholesale, they adopt uh, evangelical Christian doctrine, Mm -hmm. but, you know, they may still participate in 
some of the festivals or some of the um, events associated with Jewish life. Yeah. And they continue to keep that almost as this the customary The cultural thing. Jewish things they keep while the doctrinal things are close to Christianity or yeah. just Christianity. Yeah, exactly. And so, like I said, many would many would not even consider it a sect of Judaism. They would say it's just you know, hmm. Christianity uh, veiled in some Jewish culture or would even take offense <laughs> to yeah. calling that Judaism. So um, I'm not making a judgment on if it is or isn't. That's just a, it's a common thing that you will see, you may hear of Messianic Judaism. Yeah. And that's essentially what it is. Um, so those are some of the main, you know, there's, there's other religions that have a perspective on Jesus. Um, but I want to kind of go ahead into some of the secular views. Uh, some of you may have seen a book that just hit, well, not just, uh, maybe six months ago or a little longer, um, hit the New York bestseller list. It's a, it's a book called Zealot by Retza Aslan, and he got some coverage. Uh, he was interviewed on Fox News, and they kind of tried to tear him apart, and, you know, it was this uh, interesting <laughs> interview. <laughs> um, and that just got him more publicity and probably sold more books for him. <laughs> um, but essentially his whole book is about re-looking at the historical figure of Jesus as um, kind of this political radical who fought against a corrupt religious system. Mm -hmm. So he really sees him as sort of this social advocate who understood that Judaism had been corrupted in that time period, and he was sort of fighting against that. Um, You know, there was even, to use the term zealot, there one of the disciples was a zealot Mm -hmm. and someone who was kind of fighting against the powers that be at that time. And so he kind of paints this picture. Uh, it's a pretty interesting book. And, um, you know, while obviously I don't agree with his perspectives, he's a great writer and um, it was an interesting read. Hmm. And, uh, you know, there, if you want to go for a more sort of colloquial understanding of just asking people on the street, some may say, oh, you know, he was, he was a prophet and he had an idea of how to sort of look at, you know, where the world was going and give these good lessons. Um, but nothing more than that, just a simple, you know, prophet of his time. Some may say he was just a great man. He was a social mm-hmm. advocate. He helped the poor and he did good things, but nothing more than that. Um, I was reading a book called the, the historical Jesus five views and there's five different authors. One of them is a very f- famous, uh, scholar whose name is John Dominic Crossan, and he kind of paints Jesus as this uh, itinerant cynic philosopher, so this guy who kind of wandered from place to place, teaching a particular philosophy kind of based in a little bit of cynicism and, you know, yeah. stoic belief. And so he kind of paints Jesus as this other type of figure. Um, and really there's there's almost unending views that you could have for Jesus. And like I said before, it really... At the end of the day, you you kind of see people just painting a picture of Jesus how they want to because there's not a lot of yeah. historical evidence. So at the end of the day, you're interpreting small amounts of evidence through a huge filter. Okay. So an example of uh, you know people kind of coming together and trying to figure out who this Jesus was has really uh, kind of came into a formal process in the last 200 years. And some some of the listeners might have heard of something called, you know, the quest for the historical Jesus. Hmm. And it's really, it's kind of happened in three phases over the last uh, 200 years. Uh, And where this came out of is the rise of uh, historical critical scholarship, uh, particularly starting in Germany. Um, So you have a bunch of these, you know, Christian German scholars who said, you know, what do we really know about that uh, outside of the Bible? Let's go back and look at the history surrounding it, try to find, you know, what can we truly know about the historical Jesus? Not not necessarily just the Jesus, the Messiah that we see in the Gospels uh, and the book of Acts, but um, the Jesus that we can know certain things about historically by looking at extra biblical historical records. Uh, and so there's this this sort of quest for it, um, different authors like the really the first uh, the first quest for the historical Jesus uh, started 
uh, most would say in 1836 by a guy uh, by a guy David Friedrich Strauss, and he wrote this book um, in German. It's Das Leben Jesu, and really just sort of looking at the historical Jesus like no one had ever done before, just saying, "What do we actually know about him?" Mm -hmm. You know, not just from the Bible, but from history. Um, and this quest continued for decades. Um, and really uh, ended in 1906 by a guy, uh, Albert Schweitzer, who said he wrote a book called The Quest of the Historical Jesus. And, and really, he sort of summarized his whole idea of what the worth of this historical quest was. And he said, fresh attempts at explaining Jesus tell us more about the author than the person they seek to describe. The authors seem to have looked into the well of history, searching for Jesus and seeing their own reflection. Hmm. So essentially when he wrote this book, people realized, okay, there's all of these, you know, views on the historical character of Jesus, but they, they look so different that when you really look at them, like I said before, it just kind of ends up being, what do you want them to be? Okay, write a book about it, you yeah. know, and use the evidence you want to support the view that you want to support. Um, and so that kind of ended the first quest. And the second quest sort of went from the 50s to the 70s, uh, based in a lot of existential thought. You know, you have French authors, um, and philosophers like Camus and, and Sartre writing existentialist philosophy and, and literature. And so a lot of those um, theologians in that area were also being affected by that. So they kind of re-looked at this uh, Jesus of history through that lens, but it really ended with some of those writers kind of stopping to write and the scholars being less influenced by them. And that quest was uh, pretty fruitless as well. Um, but then the third quest began in the 1980s, and that was kind of fueled by some new archaeological finds and manuscript data. And just kind of a, you know, every time you have a new generation of scholars, you have people who mm -hmm. want to discover something new or say something different. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the third quest began with that. And, and probably the most uh, important and influential piece of that third quest that many people have heard of is called the Jesus Seminar. And so this is a group of around 150 scholars um, and even some laymen. And it was founded in 1985 by a guy named Robert Funk. And this seminar was active for a number of years. But really uh, what's known about them is sort of this process that they used to determine what parts of, you know, Jesus' sayings in the Bible can we know are you know, historically reliable due to, you know, let's look at the culture, let's look at the history of that time. How does that match up with um, what we see in the Bible and how do we determine what's true or not? You know, obviously as um, Christians, we believe that, you know, the Bible is the word of God so that when we read something that Jesus said in the Bible, we believe he actually said it. But these are scholars, some atheists, some agnostics, some professing Christian uh, a mix uh, that are trying to figure out what he actually said and mm -hmm. kind of questioning the reliability of the biblical accounts. Um, so their process was really through this council reconstructing the figure of Jesus. And what they did is they, um, they took about 500 statements or chunks of Christ's teachings in the Gospels and they separated them. And then they each took votes on, you know, so let's look at saying one, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. And if you thought that it was definitely something Jesus said, you would put a red bead down, which was worth three you know, points. Uh, if you thought it was probably something Jesus said, they, it would be worth two points. And that was a pink bead. If it was probably something that Jesus did not say, they'd use a gray bead. That was one point. And if it was a black bead, they that basically meant that's definitely something Jesus did not say. Hmm. Uh, and you, you might wonder, okay, there's these, all these old scholars throwing around colorful beads. Yeah. You know, w what determines, is it just by their own whim? Well, um, to a certain extent, yes, uh, it is. It depends on their own feeling about it, but there is a, uh, some criteria that they used. So the criteria for authenticity was orality. So if they believe that in that time period, that was something that could be passed orally because there was a, 
you know, period between when things happened and when they were written down, mm -hmm. it had to be something that was easily passed from one person to the other. So for example, more catchy, small phrases to them would be more likely to be something Jesus actually said. Hmm. Um, uh, actually, interestingly enough, one of the criteria was irony. Uh, they believed that Jesus used a lot of irony and, and sort of flipped stories on their head at the last minute, mm -hmm. and they see that consistent through all of what they know about Jesus. So that would, if they saw that, they'd say, oh, that seems like something Jesus would say. Mm -hmm. And then um, if it talks about trusting God, they, for some reason, they found that criteria to be, um, you know, significantly related to Jesus. So things uh, that were talking about trusting God, they believed were, you know, accurately from Jesus. And then criteria for uh, them being inauthentic was self-reference. So any of the I am statements where Jesus is referring to himself, hmm. they believed were in, you know, not something that Jesus would have said framing material so if he's sort of building up a structure around something that they believe he said they would think oh maybe that was added in later to set the stage for something that he actually said uh -huh. um you know if it's community issues or a theological agenda so you know is it saying something that might be applicable to the church that was currently reading it in the times when the gospels were being written well if that's the case then maybe that's someone putting something in hmm. late at a later date. Uh, and, and at the end of this whole council, all of these uh, people who are sitting down putting these beads in, what they found uh, out that, you know, averaging all these points is that only 18% of what we believe uh, Jesus said in the Bible can firmly be attributed to Jesus. Uh, and, you know, which essentially means that in their opinion, 82% mm -hmm. of what we see in there cannot, you know, doesn't have sufficient evidence yeah. of being said by Jesus. Uh, now, these criteria that they use, I'm not going to say that they're completely baseless, but they, to some extent, have, um, they're not completely objective. They're Yeah, I wonder what the, what the reasons behind saying something like any I am statement would be rejected. Um, you you would think there'd be a, a a lot of back story to to why something so bold <laughs> would be asserted f for that because um, you know a simple reading of that doesn't really make sense. It, yeah. What, what what was what was kind of there? There's almost a feeling that this seminar went into it kind of already yeah. <laughs> already projecting what they wanted the outcome to be and, yeah, and creating I, a framework t to almost guarantee that the outcome would be something like 18 percent is that is that true or yeah I, I mean you know i i can't obviously get into the minds of every one of those people that were involved in that but to a certain extent yeah it does hmm. it does look like i mean even just determining that irony is a thing that jesus commonly used and now it's more complicated than that it's not just we think you know, that Jesus was ironic. Yeah. Um, you know, they'll look at source material and try to figure out, okay, what, what do we believe dates as the oldest? And those will probably be the most accurate. And then they build this picture of Jesus using that, you know, those kind of methods. Uh, but yeah, I mean, to a large extent, to me at least, it does seem like they're kind of going in with a particular picture of Jesus already in mind and sort of making the decision ahead of time. And so, you know, that was the whole Jesus seminar. And, you know, they're not really super relevant to us today as far as, I mean, you don't see them still producing work or, mm -hmm. you know, being influential in society. It really it died yeah. out in the 90s mostly. I mean, they continued to, to meet uh, even, I think, a little bit into the 2000s, but it's really not a relevant group hmm any longer and, and also they didn't even draw from necessarily the foremost and top level scholars some some were but a lot of them weren't it was yeah. sort of just up to robert funk who started the group it was really just who do i want to invite yeah type of thing so um yeah jesus seminar interesting to learn about um definitely doesn't cause me to question 
Jesus or what the Bible says about him. But it's still interesting to know as you talk to people out there who have, you know, maybe they watched a PBS special on the Jesus seminar and say, oh, come on, we know that Jesus didn't say all those things. And and you may say, oh, well, okay, I kind of know where they're coming from. Maybe they just, you know, heard about this and just kind of took it for what it was. Yeah, you yeah. Know, to well, one interesting thing I heard about the Jesus seminar um and you can fact check me on this, but uh, that that the question of whether Jesus existed um, in the latest one, or at least eventually, what well, wasn't even brought up anymore, because mm-hmm. even in such a secular uh, a group or, or or such a critical group as this, um, the existence of Jesus was was not even in question. And and I think the person on the street, um, a lot of times, uh, pe- people might think that this is actually in question. Well, what is the evidence of Jesus actually existing? What, why, why is can we be so confident that um, you know, despite what he said, what they say he said, that really across the board we get confirmation that okay, this Jesus was a real character, was a real historical figure. Well, join us next week for part two to get the answer to that question and and some more. Uh, questions on the historicity of Jesus, and, and we'll we'll look at the evidence, what, why is it so obvious that Jesus was a real person, and, uh, and, and once we've established that he was a real person, who exactly was he? Uh, is our perception of him accurate, or what does history say about who Jesus really was? So I hope you'll join me next week for the second part of uh, my conversation with Zach Carney about the historicity of Jesus.